Good morning. Do you have enough money? Brian Houston asked that of his congregation at one point. Most people don't. Well, what do you do with the money you have and how do you get the money you have? Who is your provider? The message I have for you right now is from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 9. It's entitled Finding the Real Source of Financial Security, Sufficiency, and Maybe Prosperity. In the 1930s, 1940s, uh, in Toronto, Canada, Pastor Oswald J. Smith was uh, preaching at the People's, uh, People's Church. The church is still there, and I believe that his son uh, took over for afterwards. And uh, you can find his books uh, through Amazon. They're very inexpensive, and they're still worth very much worth reading. And he spoke about giving and generosity. And he said, speaking about the Great Depression, during the days of the Depression, Hundreds of men came to my office for a handout or a shakedown for the night. Many to a time I asked them this question. When you were earning money, did you square with God? Did you give to God that which belonged to him? Never once did I have that question answered in the affirmative. Every man who came for a handout had to admit he had not squared with God in the years of prosperity. In other words, their prosperity had not resulted in generosity. And his conclusion, Pastor Smith's conclusion, is backed by his experience in Scripture, said, Give according to your income, lest God make your income according to your giving. There's a real road in the Scriptures Definitely into financial uh, sufficiency and provision during most times. If you're not under a, a severely persecuting government, or if you're not having to face daily bigotry and prejudice on your job, you may well have financial sufficiency and blessing, according to the scriptures, according to testimony of many godly consecrated believers over the centuries. You may even have God providing you in some wonderful way, for you in some wonderful ways. And this gives us the freedom to be open-handed and generous, knowing that you always have enough for yourself and more to give to others. Do you have enough money? Do you have enough money to give? Not, do you have enough money to provide for yourself so you don't have to work for the rest of your life? That's not what this is all about. That's not what uh, prosperity is about. You know, again, it's beyond what Brian Houston did with Hillsong when he got up and asked people if they had enough money with a greasy smile and <laughs> prosperity teaching is unbalanced, is taking scriptures out of context and not understanding uh, many ways. The type, the way of the covenant, which we've been given under the new covenant. But when you look in the New Testament, in the way Paul talked to the church in Corinth, he talked about a matter of giving and offering for the poor believers in Jerusalem taking from the churches in Greece and giving an offering to them as a demonstration for their love for their brother, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, a lot of Gentiles giving to Jewish believers. Yeah, that's revolutionary right there, revolutionary love right there, providing for their brothers and sisters in Christ voluntary. There wasn't a tax agent at their door knocking on the door for that, them to give money to others to, re, to redistribute money. Rather giving out of their heart, out of their love. And this establishes the basic principles of giving here. You'll find them throughout the New Testament, and you can find guidance in the Old Testament, even in Proverbs too, about uh, someone who is generous will be provided for. And this provides guidance for us so that we're not mastered by our income and our possessions, so that we master our income and our possessions under the Lordship of Jesus for the glory of God. So this is it, Matthew, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 9. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, cheerful you can also translate that generous, too. That's, I think that's actually the preferable translation. It's not someone giving, ah, 
it's something being generous and that's an alternative uh, definition for that word i think it fits the context better than cheerful but continuing onward uh, verse 8 and god is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times you may abound in every good work as it is written he is distributed freely he is given to the poor his righteousness endures forever first god wants believers in christ to choose to give generously his call gives us the generous opportunity to know his blessing and pass that blessing on to others freely you receive freely give his opportunity to show the change that Christ has made in our lives by making us freely generous. And the knowledge of the consequences should guide the choice to give. We're to choose with the realization that God may well treat us in accord with our own giving. Verse 6. The point is this, or remember this, as in, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Yeah, sowing and reaping here applied to finances. Taken over from the Old Testament teaching here is what Paul's doing. Treating believers as responsible adults and telling them the consequences of giving. Yeah. Yeah, he's talking to the people in Corinth as if they're adults. They were a church that had some problems. You need to look over the letters and you'll see that. Telling them the consequences of giving. Make, leaving a choice up to them in this passage. And he doesn't give them any real condemnation for meager giving, but warns them that they'll get a meager blessing and they come by that. And a greater blessing of God is promised for those who are generous. It's like Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's in the book of Acts. That's a quotation of Jesus, which... Uh, came through Paul, which wasn't in the Gospels. Anyone who says that Paul never quotes Jesus. The most, one of the most common sayings we know from Jesus comes, comes from Paul. So, the matter of giving is personal responsibility before God. Your personal responsibility, my personal responsibility. Knowing the consequences for each of us is to guide our choice. And it's not giving for, just simply for financial return alone. I've given for years nearly a half century now and uh, it's not just financial return it comes in different ways but above all faith in God as our provider the one who gives to us to give to others freely received give freely give and we, we're trusting him that his reward and his provision will be to us as we're generous with what he's given to us and it's a general truth that those who are generous out of faith and obedience to God have found this, found his provision for them and what they have. There's a man named A.A. A. Hyde who was a millionaire manufacturer. And he began to tithe when he found himself at one point $100,000 in debt. And this was years ago. That was a lot of money. It might be more like 10, to 10 million or more in, in modern terms. But he began to tithe to give the tenth of what God had given him back to God through the church, to the poor, others, whatever way, to give it in some way which God had decided. And he did this because he realized that God is his first creditor. The first person to give is God, to get back, to, back to is God through what we've been given to give, not we're not going to get support him in heaven, but we are going to support the causes, the concerns which are dearest to his heart. And eventually, as uh, uh, Mr. Hyde did this, he found that eventually all his other creditors were paid in full and he got out of debt and he had sufficiency and uh, but most likely because of the type of business he was in, he found he had pros some sort of prosperity there. So God desires there are giving should come from the choice to be generous. The free choice of the believer is responsible out of God. He's talking to us as adults here who should have some sort of understanding and responsibility for our own finances. 
and as our hearts are changed, our life is changed by Jesus, yeah, we're going to become more generous, whether we, like, whether we think we are when we first come to know Christ or not. God's going to eventually touch our heart as far as what we're giving. So verse 7, uh, Paul goes on and says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful, or again I say, a generous giver. The free, responsible choice of an adult who knows their own finances, they're responsible for their own finances, is what Paul is talking about here. Free choice, not a guilt trip here. And Paul is actually, the way he's putting this contract, saying this is the temple taxes of the Jews, which we see Jesus, um, uh, a man coming by, uh, talking to Peter and Jesus about the temple tax, not out of compulsion, not reluctantly. And that excludes also secular taxation, too, is fulfilling us. Freely under compulsion, what you give to the government does not come except under compulsion, under the compulsion of law, the law of the land, the law of the government. But this is out of the freeness, freedom of a changed heart. So God appeals to their desire to please God, to love others, to give. And on the one hand, it would definitely be a witness to the Jews back in Jerusalem, the poor Jews there and, and the church there, of the reality of the love and the conversion of the Gentiles there in Corinth. Because uh, it would probably some people who are still wondering about those uh, Christians back in Corinth, whether they were really born again or not, whether God had really opened the gospel to them. So this would be a witness of them that the fruit in Corinth of lives changed for the gospel was true. So, the right motive in giving, which scripture talks about right here, is freely chosen generosity. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. No guilt trips, avoiding giving and guilt. I've uh, avoided giving in some cases where a, a person in leadership tried to really press really hard on a guilt trip as a I can't give under that motive and that situation. And no sense of obligation, overly emotional appeals, or even I find that some people view their giving as an investment in church that they give with hoping to get something back as far as control of the church, leadership in the church, or something like that. A stockholder mentality to buy influence in the church with giving. The choice, which is given here in verse 7, is giving in your heart, not reluctantly under compulsion, but generosity, generosity, generosity. Give to please God without any personal consideration as to how much you're going to get back. Because um, if you try to put God up to the math, you might find that God uh, is a master of math and may do some things with the math that you will surprise you either way. So as we let go with our giving, with no strings attached, to give entirely to God, to give the needs, the people that are on the heart of God, that's the type of giving which God seeks and will guide us to be generous. There was once a little boy who uh, uh, spoke to his father you know, seeking some money for the church offering, and the only spare change his father had at that time was a penny. Again, this is years ago. And uh, the little boy said to the father, but I can't put just a penny in the collection. You don't want me to look cheap to the Lord, do you? Do you want God to look at you as cheap? The motive that God seeks for giving, the motive that he honors is freely chosen generosity. The free choice is evidence often of the personal state, a spiritual state, where a person is doing following the Lord. And giving may vary with your circumstances. You may be able to give a little, there have been times in my life when I've received, been making very little, which I, but still I've given out of that, you know, maybe uh, $25 out of a paycheck or something like that. But still, I giving it out of faith, there are times I've given much more. But your circumstances, you know, may give you to uh, look at what you can give and give according to that. But whatever our generosity is, it's not really a sacrifice when you look at what Jesus has done for us. When you look how he sacrificed himself on the cross for us, 
and how he uh, gave his life for us. Not really a sacrifice, but a generosity that comes from his generosity. And we can be generous if we realize that God has already given his all to us. And we demonstrate our appreciation of his generosity to us when we give like this. Do you appreciate what God has done for you? Do you appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus? Or do you think that you deserve that in any way? Wow, I would never want to have a heart so cold and callous and sense of privilege to think that I deserved what Jesus had done for me. But as we appreciate the love of God in Jesus Christ, his love will make us more loving and behind that love that we receive from him transform us to be loving to give generously. And giving is not only a matter of carefully considered obedience and love back to God, it's a demonstration of faith in God before others. Generous giving demonstrates faith in God to provide. We trust in the faithfulness to provide of an almighty God, his faithfulness. And as we give, we demonstrate that we have faith in him. And it's going to mean that we're not going to depend upon others. We're going to have an opportunity to give to others on what he's given to us. Giving demonstrates faith in the ability of God to provide, trusts him to provide. We trust in God to provide so that we can be self-sufficient, not dependent, and we can continue demonstrate uh, in generosity to be, that that'll be real as we continue to give. Verse 8. I've used this in praying with people and uh, people who've given. And sometimes it's convicted people who haven't given who expected God to, to uh, underwrite their bills. But, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, to, to make all grace abound to you. So that having all, all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. The grace of God here is not talking about grace of God for salvation to eternal life from sin and death. Yeah, that's the grace of God we need first. We need work in our lives first, but rather, the grace of God talking about here is his generous blessing, his graciousness in providing for our physical and our material needs because we do look to him. We're not a self-made man or woman in any way, but we receive what he has given to us. And all that we have materially, physically, is by the grace of God anyway. And as we experience the increase and abundance of his grace for our financial situation, it will mean complete self-sufficiency, not dependency. People who are dependent upon others, there are some other places in scriptures they need to read, like First and Second Thessalonians, about working, things like that, not being dependent. The increase in the abundance of his grace will mean complete self-sufficiency. And as we trust in the promise of his provision, it'll mean that we'll be continually exercising faith in his promise through prayer. Yeah, it's not a case where we give and don't pray. We pray and give at the same time, and we lift up the, what we give to him in prayer as uh, our offering back to him. And we ask him to provide for us, and he does. He often does. And we commit this situation to him by following also his normal way of provision through work. We seek sufficiency through work, working with will, uh, working with skill, wisdom, and diligence. You'll find that in the book of Proverbs, working with skill, wisdom, and diligence. I would hope that no one who, who has an ear out for prosperity teaching thinks that it meet, lets them off the hook for having to earn a living. That's magical thinking. That's not what the scripture is talking about. Look also back at Proverbs again, working with skill, wisdom, and diligence. And also look to be wise in the use of your finances. That's all part of the scriptural way of uh, doing what God has said is our part to receive, to have provision. And to have all that we need. Paul talks about here having all sufficiency in all things at all time. Sufficiency. Not over necessarily uh, way beyond our means, overflowing prosperity, not necessarily multi-billions of dollars or whatever it may be, not necessarily wealth and riches as compared to others, 
but yeah, food, food, clothing, he's often provided, even for people in some very difficult circumstances. I encourage you to look at Proverbs chapter seven, uh, 30, verses 7 through 9. Proverbs 30, 7 through 9. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? That's prayer for basically what Jesus also said in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Sufficiency. Provision for what we really need. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus did talk about having sufficient food and clothing. And I think, again, if we're not under a terribly persecuting, uh, severe persecution or something like that, we will generally have provision if we follow God's way. We may possibly find prosperity. And if we do find prosperity, we'd better be praying about where God wants us to direct that. Not to our own self-aggrandizement, our own lusts, our own sinful desires, but to direct it toward the purposes which God has given us that for. And uh, uh, I'm going to apologize right now. Verse 9, uh, there's a problem here with, uh, it got cut off in what I was reading here. Uh, verse 9 uh, from Proverbs chapter, chapter 30 said, Lest I be full and deny you, say, Who is the Lord? Or, Lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. To live righteously, to have sufficiency to live righteously. Look at that prayer again, Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. And the pro promises of God that we find here in his word, the basis of trusting in God as one's provider. He gives us these promises so that we can trust him, follow him, so we can have sufficiency, and not to fund our selfish fantasies. Not to think that we're so great that we're giving not to make ourselves look better, especially not at someone else's expense. We take the grace of God for provision, just like salvation, I think, as we look at the promises in the word, take him by faith as provider, and then we step out on obedience. I actually do have a whole teaching I give for that. One thing, thing that I give for people after they come to know Christ and their Lord, I uh, very, very soon after having come to saving faith, I'll put a link for that in the uh, comments. We step, take him by faith as our provider. We step out on obedience. We seek work. We pray about work. We pray about being responsible for our finances. We pray about where we're going to um, where we're going to give and we get a lot closer to the Lord as we do that. Um, I found and we uh, trust in God. Um, sometimes I found that some of the people I knew who were into the prosperity teaching um, we try to shake down other people um, They, if they were making a marginal income because uh, they would give out sad stories about how they needed some help and and uh, sometimes people would provide for them and I actually did that for one woman and uh, instead of speaking appreciation she, she pulled the, the bit of money I gave her out of the desk and she went around like it was some sort of thing that she deserved or like that and it really offended some people the way she acted that way. It's not a shakedown. Don't go to a shakedown. Go to trusting God first. And this will be something that God gives you. Not just for your personal needs alone. But also the overflow. Which Paul talks about here. Abounding in every good work. To be able to overflow. To reach the needs of others through us. Do the pro people in prosperity teaching ever talk about reaching the world with gospel? Providing for the needs of the poor where the church has the, that uh, opportunity and responsibility. Providing for others. Tom Sign once in his book, The Mustard Seed Conspiracy, I, I gave away that book long ago, but he gave this challenge um, in that book. We who choose to believe God for the provision of funds to wreck multi-million dollar 
monuments for the affluent seldom find the same levels of possibility thinking for the world's poor and unreached peoples. Maybe we need to think about making our lifestyles, our church plants, our um, universities and uh, seminaries and Bible colleges a little bit more modest in some ways and use as many of those funds as we have for reaching the world's poor and unreached peoples. So, leave it that with you to consider, to pray about. So, continuing on with the passage, we have one verse less, left to look at. Generous giving demonstrates the reality of faith and obedience to God. Giving means observable growth in faith in God and obedience to his word. And Paul talks about this in verse 9. As it is written, he is distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. This is a quotation of Psalm 112, verse 5, one of the wisdom psalms, the Old Testament description of a faithful and righteous man, not someone who has a lot and gloats about it, but someone who gives to the poor, distributes freely, and is righteous forever. His generation, generosity in his generation is the outward demonstration of his faith in God, his delight in God's word. The faith that expressed itself in giving was observable righteousness. The act of righteousness is the person who had faith in God. So, giving here is part of the development of Christ-like character after we've come to saving faith. The development of Christ-like character takes definite acts of faith and obedience. We don't get it just by sitting in a pew and soaking in the teaching. These actions include definite giving to God for the things which are on God's heart. And often, there can, when this happens, this will uncover a lot of spiritual problems in people's lives, financial and irresponsibility before God, stunted growth because of lack of giving, not trusting God, not realizing how much God is able to take us beyond what we have in ourselves not only spiritually, but in our minds, our emotions, to fill us with the fullness of Christ in this time. That only goes forward to the time which we'll see him see Him uh, face to face when we'll be glorified to be like him forever. So I think that many modern believers who come to our churches, who don't give because they don't think they have enough money, would come to stronger character, stronger capability if they began to give and they gave to the things which are at the heart of God. And they gave wisely too. Again, not only things which are heart of, at the heart of God, but giving wisely to things which have results. One of the things that um, I think you'll find several books on this, uh, that there's been a lot of generosity over the years to different causes, but in some cases it really hasn't meant that much help because it's, it's been given to uh, organizations which don't... Uh, um, have uh, very much responsibility for the way that they um, deal with their funds or uh, sometimes some some causes where the people that you're giving to you know, perhaps overseas perhaps locally become dependent upon your giving instead of living and growing to dependency themselves but uh, we can talk about those some other time there's once a believer who had been tithing he had experiencing great blessing with his family and then at one point, he began, heard a sermon talking about that as legalistic and began to cut down his giving to almost nothing. And that was the time he came into some serious financial and spiritual problems. So when he and his family came back to tithing, their blessing and their peace returned. And Pastor Randy Elkhorn has a, a good book on this. Just look up Randy Elkhorn, Amazon, wherever, A-L-C-O-R-N. And... He has a good book on uh, our um, dealing with our finances and material things from the point of the scriptures. I'd encourage you to read that through. And he had 10 letters that came to him from church families whose spiritual lives were revolutionized when they put their faith into practice by tithing. Again, we don't find tithing per se commanded among believers in the New Testament, but it's always been suggested as the least that we can do. So the Christian leader said of himself in his life, 
uh, one of the leaders in this church said, the Lord got our hearts when we began to tithe. So the responsibility of the believer in Christ is first of all, to be a wise manager of the finances that God gives us. And that's something that we should often be teaching our children from the uh, first time they begin to uh, work and receive money. And I do know the families that do this, but uh, um, I found that when I was growing up, I, I began, until I really began in uh, be about 20 years old, that uh, I found out swimming upstream in my family to begin to do this. But we do have an indication of the heart before God, state of our heart before God, how we use our finances. Our finances are a pointer, a gauge as to what's in our heart before God very often. And the promise of God's complete provision for our personal needs is increased as we see that we're also Christ's way to supply the physical and spiritual needs of others. And Hebrews chapter 13 verses 5 and 6 commands contentment to us. If we trust God as our provider, we'll be able to be content with what he gives us. And we'll be content with following Christ, trusting in his provision, being satisfied with his provision, and not looking to others with envy and all sorts of other stuff as to thinking that this person has more than me and that person didn't deserve that and that person has less than me, so that person must be inferior to me. So that, that, that weird comparison that we do and that getting out of the rat race to try to make ourselves look better. Contentment in Christ is possible if you trust Christ as your provider. And I mentioned earlier about sometimes that uh, God has provided really miraculously. There have been all sorts of stories I've known over the years. There have been some of provision which unexpected uh, really came wonderfully. Uh, back in seminary, there were some people who had the who uh, had been under some financial cliffhanger. They said that God always comes through. Just sometimes He scares you to death. But I'd like to. Um, you know, just as an example of provision, Corey and Betsy Ten Boom in Raven's book. Uh, it's been, been a while since I read this story, but uh, they, I believe that they had a bottle of vitamins there in the middle of the German concentration camp. And there was a funny thing about that bottle. It never ran out during the time that they were there. God provided for them. They often didn't have enough food they lost weight, definitely. You don't want to go on the concentration camp diet, but God provided for them in that way. They had a bottle of vitamins which never ran out. So, just leaving you with that right there. God has been generous to us materially, spiritually, through Jesus Christ. And his provision is his love gift to us that we can see and experience now. He gives us, first of all, most importantly, his spiritual gift for us of eternal life and all spiritual blessing that we have then, the Holy Spirit, prayer, his fellowship above all, comes through his Son, Jesus Christ. And the love of God comes to us through his Son, the crucified and risen Lord. His infinite, eternal love has left us, has truly made us eternally, entirely blessed and as you understand all that you'll understand that financial and provision in that proper perspective yeah he has been perfectly loving to us and by I encourage you and challenge you right now by a conscious act of faith right now take God as your provider through Jesus Christ claim him according to his promise Look at these verses. Look at others who talk about God as provider. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. I've often used that in prayer. You know, talk about food and clothing and, and so on. Make him Lord and master of all that you are. Ooh. Is he Lord and master of all your material possessions? Or are you holding back things that this is mine, this is the Lord's, this is mine, this is the Lord's. Or to where that uh, the Lord only gets a little, little bit and you have, you have all the rest. Make him Lord Master of all that you are. All that you have is his anyway because he gave it to you first, not yours. And trust all that you are, all that you have in his hands. And look at yourself 
as a person who's been given the responsibility to use that wisely. And you can even right now, write that down inside your Bible. Yeah, you can write inside your Bible. It's not, um, if you have a physical Bible there, it's not so sacred that you can't write a note in the blank pages in the front or the back. Put the date there, make it a written commitment that on this day I've taken God through Jesus Christ as my provider. And look at your income also. Consider your giving to God. He's given through your responsibilities in the Word, the local ministry of the church. There is a place where really for supporting pastors in, in the church. And I think that pastors really do need to uh, remember that, that uh, to be responsible with their, the, 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 what they've been given to make the best use of their time because they're being supported for the ministry of the word the, through the giving of the people. I've known pastors who uh, um, you get to the end of the week and you find out they've been spending the whole week watching videos. Well, look at the word, be responsible as far as the word, ministering to people, praying with people, and uh, trusting God to provide, provide for your ministry through the people of the church local ministry of the church, reaching the world with the gospel, also, that's also uh, commended in the, in the scriptures, and also of those who don't have enough for themselves. Yeah, we do need to be concerned for the poor. I'm not going to say, give you a lot of guidance on that, ex except to say, uh, be concerned for that. And get, I don't believe the government um, was ever designed to do that. That uh, Jesus could have easily told Pontius Pilate, any of the Herods, about the need, or spoken to any of his disciples about giving to the Romans, to the government, to give back to the poor. He put it back to their personal responsibility throughout there. So, for all believers, we've always, it's uh, pretty much something that uh, you'll find generally as across uh, denominations and so on. A tithe is a minimum goal. If you're not currently tithing, make the commitment to God as your provider first and consider what expenses you can cut from other areas to give a tithe. Maybe you're spending a lot on entertainment, going out to eat, emotional purposes, buying clothes that are too expensive for you, clothes which you don't need. Yeah, there are a lot of Christian women who have closets that are way too full of clothes which they even rarely wear which they really don't need, which they just bought to impress other women. So make some sacrifice in your lives. Maybe some of these things you'll need to sell to be able to get them off your heart and be able to use the, them in some way. But make some sacrifice in the first check that represents the real tithe and the income that's under your responsibility from money that you've rightly earned from and for money that you're seeking to be rightfully responsible. And if you're already giving a tithe, work out your giving on, with a budget. Yeah. Yeah. Consider how much money you're regularly giving week to week uh, and consideration of the spiritual merits of the recipients. Uh, some people you probably shouldn't be given to, even if they call themselves Christian, even if they are ministers up there and you they do have a Bible in their hands, Maybe you need to consider the spiritual merits of those who are receiving. If they themselves are not being generous, if they're looking to you to give to them to provide, to make them rich, you probably need to be giving elsewhere to a place which is sponsoring and seeking to uh, uh, have a local ministry of the church and also reaching the world with the gospel and also ministering to the needs of the poor, the disabled, and so on. So... Develop a budget with personal responsibility for God's money, which is given to you, and you develop a plan of regular giving. And be ready sometimes to sacrifice your own comforts, your own desires sometimes, that maybe you need to postpone some desires. Maybe you need to look to where, whether you really need something, sometimes in response to the leading of God. And giving will be more regular and systematic when you, if you are on a, any type of regular income, giving with each pay period or week or month, however, however, but seek to give regularly. But before, God wants anyone to give any financial gift. He wants you to receive his greatest gift to you. Eternal life, 
through his son Jesus Christ. He has given all that he has to give to us first, his death on the cross for our sins, so that we could have eternal life to live with him. And he wants our hearts to be given to him in love and trust before he wants any money for us. And so give him your heart and your trust in Christ. Give and receive his greatest gift to you. And with all this that I've said, don't give me any money. I've got enough. I've worked for what I need and I do have sufficient income. So I seek no money from anyone. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope that you begin to discover how generous God is to you and how generous you can be to others because he's been generous to you. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And God bless you in his richest ways. First of all, salvation with the wonderful, his wonderful loving presence. And then to provide for you sufficiency. Sufficiency in all that you need.